Hi and welcome to the third episode of the third season of the Page One Podcast. I'm Marco. I'm Tarek. And uh, for those of you just joining, on the Page One Podcast we like to talk to writers of all kinds about their writing careers, their process and how they got a break into the industry. Yeah, we've had some really good writers so far. We have, so please go to our web page and check out all yeah. the previous episodes or, or on your app. Never mind previous episodes, Marco. Who's on this episode? Yes, very good point, Tarek. We have a very, very special guest this episode. We have Mr. Gareth L. Powell, Ooh. who is an award-winning British sci-fi author. Many people will know him because he is a huge presence on Twitter and yes. what I call writing Twitter. So if, if you're into writing, you'll tend to follow lots of authors and agents and yeah. people giving advice. And there is no one that gives you more advice and more support on Twitter, I think, than Gareth. Yes, he is, I think, very well known for continually being there to give advice to people and support. And it's, it's, which is a very, but especially nowadays when most of Twitter is a bit of a garbage dump. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, we actually speak to Gareth about that. But as well as that, he is, of course, an award-winning author, as I said. His first series of books was known as the Akak Macaque books. And then his most recent trilogy is the Embers of War trilogy, which has just had the final book in the trilogy released, Light of Impossible Stars. I highly a, recommend if you've not read it, that one. It's a real uh, space epic, I yeah. think, is the way yeah. you describe and, it. And he's also done a kind of Stephen King style about writing book, which he calls about writing. Uh, <laughs> yes, Stephen King's book being on writing. Yes. <laughs> on writing, that's yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is a very good um, how to guide for anyone thinking about you know creating your prose, getting your ideas, um, and any aspiring authors out there, definitely recommend having a look at that. Yeah, and um, he, he's also written other books as well, which we talked to him about in the podcast. So we speak to him about all of this yep. uh, in, the, in the podcast. So that's all to look forward to. Oh. What's that? What is that? About? I, I, I believe that's a listener alert. Hold on a second. Let me just check. Oh my god, we've actually got an email. It's only her. taken us three years. Someone's finally <laughs> written in. We have got an email. And uh, do you want to read out the email, or will uh, I? You can go for it. Who's it from, Mister Giancarlo? Giancarlo, yes. Um, says, folks, very much enjoy the podcast and the insight into the creative process from all sorts of genres, some of which I wouldn't normally read. I wanted to ask you and your guests how you decide on which idea is the right one to write about and then commit to it. I have a lot of ideas, but never quite the conviction that I've selected the best one to take forward. Do you just know, or is it, sorry, I can't read anymore. <laughs> Do you just know, or is it a case of getting the head down and getting on with it? Well, first of all, I would be remiss if I didn't say if anyone out there is struggling with too many ideas, I would highly recommend you purchase a page one <laughs> yes, to store them sounds like all. a complete <laughs> advert, which it isn't meant to be. But yeah, I mean, uh, one way to select your ideas, I would have said, was is to get them write, written down and yeah. see what comes out of writing that idea down and how much you can build off that idea and bounce yeah. off it. But I, I can't remember who it was. It was one of our past guests, so this is terrible, <laughs> said... You know the idea is the right one when you're walking about and you just can't shake mm -hmm. that idea out of your head, yeah. and that's the one that you have to go with because yeah. that's the one that is that is telling you that it wants yeah. to be written about. And I think it's probably quite rare you get the idea fully formed in your head. It, it, it appears, and that's it, that's how it goes. I think, as you say, often you do throw it around. You add another idea to you merge two together, and and you create this new idea. So it's not it's not often an idea will come to you f fully formed, but but how you take that forward and you create that final idea is the is the hard part. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's definitely a good question, actually. We, we'll need to put that to some of our yeah, guests in we'll, the future. we'll definitely take that forward. Um, but that's our opinion for what that's worth. Probably, Probably not. not very much. No, not very much. <laughs> I would ignore that. <laughs> just <laughs> do would, the opposite of what we just said. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but, of course, if anyone else out there has ideas or has questions, they would like us to ask yes. any other future authors... We or ask us or, or, more for our great advice. <laughs> they can always get in touch with us by sending an email to podcast at rightgear.co.uk. Yeah, so we'd love to hear from you, so do drop us a line. 
Um, and otherwise, we'll just get on with the podcast and we'll be back at the end of the podcast with some more chat and to let you know about next week's guest. See you then. Did you always want to be a writer uh, since you were young? Uh, yes. Yeah, that was pretty much always the plan, although I had no idea how to go about doing that. It was... Um, I started reading um, very early before I went to school. Um, my mother taught me how to read and she would take me down the library every week and I'd get like six books out and read them in an afternoon. <laughs> so it was it, it was very much something I thought would be cool. I used to make up stories all the time. Um, and when I was in like junior school, I filled up about five or six spiral topped reporters notebooks with this great sprawling space epic which <laughs> owed a lot to um star wars and whatever had happened on blake seven that week <laughs> so it was uh yeah it was always kind of the plan but i never really knew how to turn that plan into reality so it wasn't until i was um about 30 that i started writing really seriously and when you did start writing, were you a software developer before? Is that right? Or you were working in uh, software? I worked in marketing for a software ah, company. Ah, sorry. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, I don't know anything about software, but I know how to s sort of sell it. <laughs> <laughs> but when, so having that other job, but also doing the writing, you know, it's something I think a lot of, well, certainly we yeah, know about, yeah. it, you know, fitting that into the time. Uh, yeah. how, how did you manage to do that? Uh, really badly. Um, <laughs> it, it took me two years to write a, a sort of novella length um, piece of work and then another eight or nine years to, to, to write a, a few short stories. Um, but then I kind of, I left there in 2008 mm. and my productivity soared since then so <laughs> since, since then i've written like 15 books and um all sorts of other things so um yeah having a job really gets in the way of uh, of writing but uh, <laughs> what's your also what's your advice in how how did you i mean how would you fit it in were you able to 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 write stuff at all when you were still working or, or did you really not able to write anything sort of substantial no, I, until you'd left i used to write in the evenings okay. um but as I say, it took a long time and, and uh, you know, I was working a 40 hour week yeah. in marketing, which was quite draining. Um, so coming home from staring at a screen all day to stare at a screen all evening was, was not the best. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah. I, I was I was younger then. I could, you know, I could survive on five or six hours sleep a night. So I was getting something done. Yeah. And you started, uh, you said with the novella, I mean, what was the the road to your first getting published how did that happen um i got a s couple of stories in interzone magazine and from that i got approached by um elastic press um who are sadly now defunct who said we really liked your stories would you like to do a collection oh, cool. to which i obviously said yes of course um and um Pendragon Press as well mm -hmm. um, from Wales approached me and, and asked if I had uh, any longer stuff. So I, the uh, um, the novella sort of just scraped over the forty thousand word mark. So it, it, they published it as a hardcover novel, but both of those were very small presses, and I think both of, both of them are, are probably uh, defunct now. So and they only printed three hundred copies of each book. So. Is that um, Silver Sands? Was that the first? Sil Silver Sands, yeah. yeah. Uh, and The Last Reef and Other Stories as well, which was okay. the, mm -hmm. the best of the short stories I had at the time. Um, so, yeah, those are probably collector's items in the future because there was only 300 of each published. But um, from there, that kind of was enough to get me noticed by various people. And uh, when I decided to submit a, a proposal for a novel, um, in fact, I, I submitted it to Angry Robot, but at the time they said it was too science fiction-y and they were after a bit more sort of um, genre blending. Mm, okay. um, 
and, and so they they passed it to Solaris, and Solaris picked it up, and that was the recollection. And right. then my next book, with then they said, "You've got another one. You want to write?" And I said, "Yeah, but it's got a monkey in it." And they said, <laughs> "They said go for it." And you know, the rest is history, really. So you you managed to get in by. Can you? How do you mean when you said you pitched the novel? Was that before you'd even written it then for the recollection? Yeah, I didn't realise that you weren't supposed to do that <laughs> at the time. So what I did, I wrote um, an outline and the first couple of chapters and mm-hmm. took it along to an Easter con. Oh, okay. Um, and and p- pitched it to uh, to them. But, you know, Solaris was very good. They, they said, yeah, you know, can you write that in six months? And I said, of course I can. Wow. Not knowing if I could or not, but... <laughs> Yeah, you always say yes to that, absolutely. And it sounds like you did all that without getting an agent as well. So you you, you went to the publisher directly rather than having going through the agent route. That's right. Again, I didn't realise you weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> so uh, my kind of path to publication has been sort of the backwards to the way that yeah. most people would tell you to, to do things. Um, I, yeah, I did. I did get an agent after three books with Solaris. Mm-hmm. Um, I finally got an agent and uh, um, and then I got another agent and, and moved to Titan with the Embers of War series. So. Okay. So, so the obviously the three books with Solaris and the monkeys, that, that's your Akak Macak books, is that right? That's right, yeah. 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 It, it, well, it's, it's the four books because the recollection ties in as well. Oh, so. Okay, of course. And then, the series, yeah. and, and so, so off, off the back of that, you got an agent, and then, but then you changed agents. Why was that? What was was there a problem with the first one? There just wasn't. Um, uh, trying to think of the best way to put this, we we just we just weren't compatible. syncing together. We're, we're yeah. 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 compatible. That's the word. Yeah. So um, it, it was a lovely chat, but we just you know professionally we weren't vibing. So uh, yeah. so we changed. And that, and that must be quite a hard thing to do because I know for, for so many writers that are trying to get in, you know, trying to get the agent is such, such a big deal that knowing when to say, actually, I need to throw it out and start from scratch again, that's quite a brave move to do. It is, and you have to be quite confident to do that, I think. But it's, yeah. better to, it's better to jump ship and start looking for someone else and to stay with someone who might potentially be damaging your career. So, yeah. you, have, you know, you have to think of it as a business, really. And if... It's not working from a business point of view. You have to make changes. That can be hard if you're like, you know, if the if the, the agent you're working with is, is a nice chap, is affable, and you get on well personally, but you have to be a little bit ruthless sometimes and think, yeah. you know, I'm getting, we're getting on brilliantly, but business-wise, you're yeah. not doing what I need to yeah. do. So. Yeah, absolutely. And and um, I think by the, by the time you left your agent to go to your current agent, you know, I think it had you written a book. Had you, was the Embers of War books written, and you were trying to get them out? And was that was that the problem? No, no. I had um, the monkey books were, were out, and <laughs> I, yeah, I would after the um, the third and final monkey book, I um, tried to write a very ambitious sort of quasi literary novel. I think I'd been um, overdosing on David Mitchell books <laughs> and. I tried to write uh, what would be the um, fictional demonstration of the uncertainty principle, Heisenberg's uncertainty mm-hmm. principle, okay. of, you know, um, about a guy on a spaceship who's lost his memory, and the spaceship has lost his mem- its memory as well, and they're trying to remember where they're going. In order, to, in order to do that, he has to go back and examine all his memories. So he's got a he's got a box of random objects that he's brought from earth with him and he has to go back and kind of recapture the, the memories of each of those mm. bits through his life and, yeah. and by looking back at his life he changes who he is so the act of observation changes him and so mm-hmm. um it, it didn't really work uh it was rambling and long and some of the logic was very skewed and i i refer to it now as my um my rebound book Mm-hmm. Um, because I just finished a long relationship with a monkey, and <laughs> this was my kind of um, questionable uh, follow-on. Um, so yeah, it, that wasn't working. So um, we decided it wasn't working, and then wrote *Embers of War* in mm-hmm. six months. 
Because, wow. you know, I'd spent two years on this other novel and it didn't work. So I just thought, right, I'm going to have fun now. And just went wild with Embers of War. And that was the book I should have written in the first place. Yeah. So do you want to uh, give us a summary in case the listeners aren't aware of the Embers of War series? Do you want to give us a summary of what, what the setting is, etc.? Uh, well, the setting is set three years after a, a huge and very damaging war between two human factions um, in space. And the characters are, have all been involved in the war. They were either fought in it or they were affected by it in some way from both sides of the war. And now they've come together in this organisation called the House of Reclamation that is trying to save lives. It's like... Um, it's like Thunderbirds in space. It, it <laughs> rescues stranded starships or, or crashed people crashed in, in places and stuff. So they're trying to make amends by doing that. And one of the main characters is a warship who took part in a war crime um, and then subsequently developed a conscience, which warships are not supposed to do, and resigned to join the House of Reclamation. So she's trying to come to terms with who she is now because she's hardwired to kill things mm. and blow things up mm-hmm. um, but her conscience is telling her to, to save lives and to so it's, it's really a kind of, sort of coming of age struggle that set on a, a warship who's like a 14 year old girl <laughs> with all the social charm of a missile <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wondered actually with embers of war what came first was it was it the idea for the story or was it the idea of this sentient war Ship, mm-hmm. as you say, that, that that decides suddenly that war isn't isn't the route to go down. Was it the character first, or was it was it the the story as a whole that came first? It, it was the organisation first. Right. I, I was okay. reading um, I was reading an article about the Titanic, um, and they were saying that before the Titanic, several other liners had gone down in the North Atlantic, but you didn't hear about them because they didn't have radio. They just vanished, and then six oh. months later, someone in New York would figure out they weren't coming. Um, <laughs> Uh, so saying in the North Atlantic, if you you're going you were going down in the like early nineteen hundreds, you might as well have been on the moon because yeah. nobody could get to you, nobody could communicate with you. And I thought that's interesting. But if we had a you know, nowadays we would send out planes, we would send helicopters, mm-hmm. we could get there quite quickly. I was thinking from a space going point of view, once you have hyperdrive and faster than light messaging, if you have a spaceship goes down in a distant star system, they can call for help. And this organisation go shooting out to uh, to try and help them. So that that was the nugget of the story. Yeah. And did you have the the so the, there it is a trilogy, Embers of War. There's Embers of War. There's Fleet of Knives, and in two weeks, I think, mm. uh, or so, uh, Light of Impossible Stars, the final book of yeah. the trilogy, comes out. Um, did you have the the trilogy planned out in your head, or did it start as one book and then, as you were writing it, you thought this this will be a bigger story. No, it was, um, we specifically sold it to Titan Books as a trilogy. Okay. So they wanted to outline for the whole trilogy. Um, but I kind of wrote the first one, so it was almost a standalone, so that people could, you know, if they people could enjoy the first one just on its own yeah. um, without having a... So there are threads mm. at the end of the first one that you know are going to lead on to something, but you don't yeah. quite know what. So it's not like there's like a massive cliffhanger at um, the end of the first book. But the, the the second two are very much, lead, you know, lead straight into each mm. other. Yeah. So. And I think with with a lot of sci-fi, we've we've chatted to a few sci-fi sci-fi authors um, in in the past, and I think one of the things that a lot of people struggle with when they write sci-fi is to create the world and the the people that live in it. And I, I thought you did a really good job. There's there's um, one part of it that I re- that always stuck with me was the hyperdrive when they when I can't remember what the exact term for that you use, but when 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 they go to faster than light speed, there's this idea that if you stare into the into the passage of, of the stars, you kind of go mad. And I thought that was quite a cool, almost horror, quasi horror aspect to it. But but how do you create a world, a sci-fi world like that, without exposition, just telling everybody stuff? Um, you drop just very small nuggets in. Um, my kind of um, the way I think of it was very influenced by the first Star Wars movie mm-hmm. um, when Luke goes to see uh, Obi Wan. 
um, and Obi-Wan pulls out the lightsaber and says, this was your father's weapon. And Luke's going, you fought in the Clone Wars? Mm-hmm. And then the Clone Wars are never mentioned again in the whole film. But people go, what the hell were the Clone Wars? They sound really <laughs> cool. Yeah. And, you know, and, and your father was betrayed by a... a, a um, a Sith or whatever and he's just saying these little things but the fact that you're thinking about the Clone Wars and all of this is it makes the world so much bigger in your imagination mm-hmm. so I try to do that not completely um, dump information on people but mm-hmm. just mention things that make the world what it is and, and kind of only explain what is extremely necessary for the story so um, yeah some people prefer the bigger I mean Ian Banks was a master at the exposition he would spend a whole chapter telling you how this giant um monolith or something yeah, was yeah. created yeah. the history of it and then the characters would walk past it in like two scenes or whatever and that it's never seen again but i prefer just to sprinkle yeah. sprinkle mm-hmm. stuff on so. i think that's the way i prefer it as well because i think you you can gauge a lot about how an object works by how it's used or talked about or it's you know and and i think it's a lot smarter well i feel it's a smarter way of getting it because you can get over it quickly you're not you're keeping the pace going, aren't you? You're not slowing down. But uh, at the same time, as you were saying with what Ian Banks does, I think there is a merit. It, it can give you a sense of scale or history or that's something. True. Yeah, if, that's true. If, if something like a monolith or something de- is is deserving of two pages of description or something, then that suddenly makes it... Yeah. It feels like a, a bigger thing, I think, sometimes. But I suppose it's the balance is the difficulty. Um Wait, so if you sold this as a as a trilogy, um, I take it you had planned out the the whole trilogy arc in advance. But you know how detailed was that? Had, was it broken down into book one will be this, book two will be this, book three will be this, or did you just have the overall arc and then decide as you were writing it where the where the variant bits go? It it was. Um, well, I fi- I finished writing book one and then I wrote sort of a page or two of A4 about what was going to happen in book two and then what was going to happen in book three. So it wasn't in great detail at all, to be honest. It was quite, uh, it was slightly longer than the blurb on the back of the the novel, but not Mm -hmm. much. So it was, uh, there was plenty of room for me to to still be creative. It's, I find very, very detailed outlines, very constricting. Mm -hmm. Uh, I like the kind of organic creative process of finding out as you write what's going to happen. So I, I like to have an ending in mind. So I very much had an ending in mind for the mm-hmm. trilogy. Okay. And I had a couple of kind of points along the way that I would, wanted to hit. Um, but the rest of it, I, I kind of made up on the spot. So. And the, does that does the same apply to the characters and stuff? I mean, do you spend, how long do you spend with an idea like Embers of War? In your head, you know, I appreciate you're not writing it down as a detailed outline, but working it through in your head before you mm. actually sit down and start start getting it on the page. I'll, I'll probably write about four or five outlines. Right. Um, so each one slightly different and slightly changing it and slightly, you know, until I get to one I'm happy with. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'll start writing. So it's, it's just, I guess it's just to... Um, screen it for plot logic or what have you yeah. so um so I'll, I'll, write, I'll write it out sort of four or five times and by about the fifth or sixth time i've got something i think yeah that makes sense and now i can start writing so yeah and and how many drafts do you tend to do once you've once you've written the first half of the book do you feel you're kind of almost there with it or does it take a while for you to kind of dig down and work out how it all fits together no i tend to do kind of one draft but oh, wow. I also tend to edit as I go along, yeah. which is something else you've told you're not supposed to do. But, um, so I, 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 I do edit. Gareth. Yeah. <laughs> I do edit and tinker with it and go back and alter things as I go along. So that when I reach the end and I write the end, I can send it off to my agent fairly confident that I've kind of done a good job and then yeah. he'll, do a, he'll do a read through. And then obviously the editor a Titan will do a read through and there'll be a copy edit and a structural edit. Mm-hmm. So it will get edited. But yeah, by, the, yeah. by the time I finish writing it, it's I'm usually fairly happy with it. And do you show the work to anyone as you're doing that first draft or is it just you, you keep it to yourself until you send it off to your agent? I completely keep it to myself. Right. I've, I've 
I find if if you kind of tell somebody the story, it, it kind of ruins the storytelling. Mm-hmm. If you mm-hmm. see, it's it's like you've told the story and got a yeah. reaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a, it's the sort of thing actually that I wonder that is probably why George R. R. Martin hasn't finished Game of Thrones because <laughs> if someone else has told the story, it must be very demotivating to sit there and think I've got to write another three books of something that everyone that is, everyone yeah. knows how it ends uh, in it or yeah. one one ending of it is yeah, yeah. and and um, I, I was interested when you when you did the pitch um, of the three books is it easier to pitch a trilogy than in one week just doing one book or is there is there a, is there a danger that you overextend yourself? Um, it, the received wisdom seems to used to have been that you should try and get a series or a trilogy. Okay. Um, but things seem to be changing now in the other direction in that publishers are much keener to have standalones because yeah. trilogies always have declining sales. The, you know, the second book will never sell as well as the first book and the third book will never sell as well as the second book. Mm-hmm. So, um, because people need to get, um, with standalones, if you do five standalones, people can get on board at any point. Yeah. They yeah. don't, uh, when, so when the third book comes out, they don't go, oh, that looks really interesting. Oh, I've got to go back and buy two other books in order to like and enjoy it. Yeah. So it's, they're looking at, um, standalones or standalones set in a common universe. Mm-hmm. So, um, the two books I'm writing for Titan at the moment are two standalone novels, but they're set against in in a, the same setting, okay. right. um, but with different characters. So, kind of like the culture books, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, is that? I saw you've you've been. I think you made a tweet about a potential space opera book at some point. Is this their space opera book you're working on? No, no. This is um, the the one I tweeted about yesterday. Is um, a novella that I've co-written ah, with another okay. writer, oh, cool. uh, which yeah. should, should, should be announced soon. But um, the paperwork is just about there, so hopefully it'll be <laughs> announced. <laughs> yeah. Um, but speaking of standalone books, you also uh, last year came out as well with uh, Ragged Alice, which is a very different story, I think. It, it's you know much more grounded, yeah. obviously. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about that? Uh, well, Ragged Alice was a bit of um, it, one of those things where the story took over because what I set out to do, agreeing with my agent, was to write a kind of um, a thriller that would be on the book racks in every airport and be made a film and we would retire rich. <laughs> um, but instead I came out with this novella that was set in this small Welsh coastal town um, with, with graphic murders and a, a, a um, police detective with like a very unusual sort of psychic talent. Mm-hmm. Um, so it sort of, I, th- I think, you know, if he was hoping for the, the born identity, I kind of delivered <laughs> a, a Welsh Twin Peaks. So. <laughs> that sounds pretty interesting, that, does it? Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's, a, I, it's a book I'm very fond of, Ragged Alice. I put a lot of my kind of Welsh background in there. Yeah. And the, the, time I spent at university in Wales and, and I have, uh, you know, my father's side of the family were Welsh. So there's a lot of the kind of beauty and eeriness of the Welsh mm-hmm. countryside in there that I managed to put in. So I'm very pleased with it. It was complete, um, as you say, it was very different from what mm-hmm. I normally write in that there are no sassy talking spaceships or, <laughs> or um, homicidal monkeys running around. But... I think I had the same kind of depth of characterization I used in the other book. So it, it kind of felt like it felt like a Gareth L. Powell book instead of, you know, yeah. putting it out under a pseudonym, which I yeah. might have done if it was very different. So mm-hmm. is it is it important to you think to have like a, a bit of a break? If you if you're writing a sci fi trilogy, is it quite nice to step back from that for a little, for a, a, a six months or a year and and, and and work on something else and, and then recharge yourself almost to go back into it again? That, that was very much what I did between um, I had a year between Fleet of Knives being handed into the publisher and um, Light of Impossible Stars needing to be handed in. Mm-hmm. So I, th- I figured I can squeeze another book in here before I write Light of Impossible Stars. So um, so I, I um, wrote Ragged Alice very quickly and it was, as you say, a complete change of pace. So um, it was like almost like a... a uh, a change is as good as a rest. It was. Yeah. Um, 
I, I was able to step out and do something much different than, than just people sit, sitting around in spaceships. They mm-hmm. could get out, walk up and down in the woods and stuff. So it was, yeah. uh, it kind of, it was a recharge of a bit, yeah. And and you also, uh, you were very prolific last year because you also brought out the About Writing yes, book as right. well. Um, yeah. And I want to speak to you about that, but also about generally, um, you're well known on Twitter, I think, as one of the friendliest and most helpful authors. You always like to give advice. If people have questions, they can yeah. come to you and you'll always respond and, and give them that advice. Is that something... That, that you just enjoy doing, giving advice and helping people who are trying to write? Yeah, this was um, something, I think back 2016, um, Twitter had become a quite a divided and nasty place. Yeah. There was, um, you know, the, this was the start of the, the Brexit campaign and there was a general election and the, the Trump thing and it was becoming quite, you know, a chore to log on to Twitter in the mornings. And I just kind of thought the only thing I can do is to project positivity. So instead of sitting here complaining, I'm just going to be positive. Yeah. So I just did a tweet saying, can I help anybody with anything this, this evening? I got a massive response. Um, so I just kept doing that mm-hmm. and, you know, being the change you want to see in the world. Yeah. And, and it's, yeah, it, it's attracted me a, a large following um, who are, who are, there for me as much as my books and you know half of them probably have never even looked at one of my books but they're there for the advice for the positivity which is good um and some of them have gone on to buy my books on the back of it so it's you know you put i'm very big believer that you put good things out into the world and good things come back yeah yeah i think think there's a lot of truth in that i think Uh, and about writing is is your uh no, not novel. Uh, your your book on with writing advice in it. Um, is this just stuff that you had sort of come to learn yourself as a writer using your experience, and you thought I'll, I'll gather it all together as a, as a tool for people to use? Yeah, it's it started life as um, a sort of collection of blog posts, really, mm-hmm. that I've been posting over, over the years about how what I've discovered as I was coming into to being a writer so I just kind of I collected them together I filled in some gaps here and there I did in a few extra stuff um and, and, and that's what's come about with the book I mean it's not a it's not a book kind of instructing you how to do stuff it's mm-hmm. a book saying this worked for me you might consider doing something similar um and just encouraging rather than being very prescriptive and saying yeah. you must eat, must yeah. do that. So, yeah. I suppose you want everyone to find their own their own voice and stuff, and and a, you know, and there's only so much of here's the correct use of grammar that folk can really take. So I think I, I think I, I, your book's probably the right way of doing it, which is here's what, what worked for me. It might, it might work for you, and if not, it might give you that the idea mm-hmm. that does work for you. You know, and, and it's that kind of organic the, process mm-hmm. more than anything else. I mean, I, I think the the base sort of writing books that I've read are ones like that and, and on writing as on well writing stuff. Yeah, exactly. Stephen yeah, King and stuff yeah. like that um, that aren't prescriptive, they're just yeah, sort of showing Yeah, here's you. my experience uh, of writing. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And sometimes just seeing other people have the same problems I have is quite reassuring, isn't it? When you realise I'm not yeah. the only one who struggles with writer's block or can't get this idea to work properly and I have to step back, etc. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, and I've seen as well on Twitter actually that you've been saying that you want to write a screenplay is... is is that something that you want to move into in a big way, or is it just something you're you're thinking of experimenting with? It, it, it's something I'm experimenting with. I like the format. Um, mm. I like writing dialogue. A lot of the time when I'm writing fiction, if I'm writing a scene, I'll just write all the dialogue first and then go back and fill in the description and the action and stuff because mm. um, I just like the flow of dialogue. So it's something I've... Um, I've been sort of messing around with. I've written a few sort of experimental scripts and stuff. I haven't been chasing in a big way because I've got um, novel deadlines and so on, but it's something I would um, definitely always good to add another string to your bow. Um, yeah. Diversify, especially, uh, you know, it's um, it's not the, being a novelist isn't the best paying job in the world. So it's, uh, it's always handy to try and cultivate another income stream. Yeah, definitely. And uh, are the screenplays you're working on, are they original stories or are you 
would you be interested in adapting your own work or no i couldn't possibly i don't think i could adapt my own work i have no idea how you adapt a novel into a screenplay mm -hmm. um but the, the ones i've been writing have just been ideas they've been three or four pages i wrote 40 pages of a um a science fiction one um just for practice to see if i could do it so mm -hmm. It's um, it's uh, yeah, small beginnings, but um, it may lead somewhere. Yeah, so. definitely. So, so what's next then? It sounds like you've got quite a lot on your plate with your novels and stuff coming out. Well, I've got the two novels I'm currently writing for Titan, um, and my agent and I uh, had a meeting in London last week, and I've kind of sketched in ideas for another six books. Oh so. wow, six! Are they all in one series, or are they six different books? No, um, they're sort of novellas. Um, cool. And novels, a mixture, and, and then a, a kind of um, a sort of psychological thriller as well. So cool. that might come that may come out under a, a very kind of uh, difficult pseudonym like G. L. Powell or something. <laughs> so, but just to um, because you know if they're, they're, he's worried that if I come out with a, a best-selling thriller and people go, oh, I really like Gareth Hill Powell, and go back and pick up Akat cat, Macat, cat, we go, what the hell is this? <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, is that yeah, is so that I'm, something that that is quite important? You think then to have a a separate name for each kind of genre almost that that you want to write in? Um, I would rather not, but I can see the logic yeah. of doing it in mm -hmm. the 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 people who've read my my books up till now will have no problem coming across and reading this new book, but people who pick up the new book maybe have a problem with yeah. the uh, stuff. So I, I can, I can see, I can see the logic of it and I can see, you know, why he come back to Ian Banks, why he did Ian mm -hmm. Banks and exactly. Ian Banks. Yeah. So I, I would, I, you know, I wouldn't call myself Angela Blackthorne or something. I would, <laughs> it, it would, be recognisably me, but in a in a, in a different like yeah. uh, John Courtney Grimwood writes his thrillers as Jack Grimwood, mm -hmm. and his sci-fi as John Courtney Grimwood. Yeah. Um, his literary fiction as Jonathan Grimwood. So <laughs> it's, uh, the whole range of possibilities. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it, it, it would be something along those lines. Yeah, rather than, yeah, exactly. Just just enough so everyone knows what to expect from the book based on, on the, the name. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, what was the last film you saw? Uh, at the cinema, it was um, the Star Wars one. Oh yeah, what was right. your thoughts on it? On the Rise of Skywalker? Uh, there was. It, it was. I think. It, I think it was my favourite of this last trilogy. Mm -hmm. um, it had some pacing issues, and it felt that certain bits were neglected. And, and, and anyway, but I, th I pretty much figured out it. It seemed the most Star Warsy. Yeah, yeah. The, the, these final three. So, yeah, I, li I liked it. Yeah. And uh, what was the last book you're in? Oh, good question. I'm always, I usually have about four or five on the go. So, I'm trying <laughs> to. Um, I just um, got a, a draft of Adrian Tchaikovsky's Doors of Eden. Is that the right name? I think so. Doors of Eden, which uh, I'm not sure when that's coming out, but I've just been reading that. And it's excellent because okay. Adrian is. Just a fantastic writer, and yeah. he's, he's. You think I'm prolific? The man's a machine. He's churning out <laughs> novellas, and novels at such a rate, but he, he, the quality is is always superb. So yeah, his um, Children of Time book I thought was absolutely one of the best cyber books I've read in ages. It was absolutely fantastic. Yes, that had a, that was very reminiscent of sort of Stephen Baxter. At yeah, his best wasn't it exactly that kind of long form yeah. over millennia travel. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and the last TV show you watched, or are watching, um, if you're watching the series, uh, the Good Place. Yeah. Oh Just yeah. The, Excellent. The most, um, I think it's the penultimate episode or something that was came out this week. But yeah, I just watched that because I've stuck with it since the beginning. I just want to see how it ends now. Yeah. Uh, and okay, the the last part we do now is a kind of either or answer. So there's no right or wrong answer. It's just the first one that comes into your head. Uh, okay. Blade Runner or Blade Runner twenty forty nine? Blade Runner. Nice, excellent. Um, a real book or an e-book? Real book. A fancy restaurant or a takeaway? Takeaway. A uh, TV or cinema? TV. Kirk or Picard? Picard. <laughs> Have you watched the new show by any chance? 
I saw the first episode. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what were your thoughts? Um, I, I was a bit disappointed to find out who the girl was. Okay. Um, I'm hoping they'd do something a bit more creative than that. Um, but, you know, I, I would watch Patrick Stewart, you know, fill in his tax form. It's just, <laughs> he, he's just so watchable that, yeah. Um, that, yeah, he just he just carried that entire show just by being Patrick Stewart, really. So. Yeah, I was, I was glad to see that they didn't try to keep him, you know, in the last few films he was very much a bit of an action hero and it didn't really suit the character, but they... They very much played him as a... bit more difficult for an Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> have you been watching it, Marco? Picard? It's good? I have so watched far. it, yeah, yeah, it? No, yeah. I enjoyed it, yeah. It's uh, very Star Trek-y, I mm-hmm. say that in good and bad ways. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, like Gareth was saying there at the end, anything with Patrick Stewart is, yeah. is worth watching. Watch me in the phone book. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so yeah, no, I'm enjoying it, and I enjoyed that chat with Gareth. I yeah, really yeah, very good. good chat. A lot of good advice, um, as I would expect from from Mr. Paul. Yeah, no, it was. It, uh, hopefully, people find a lot of useful advice about writing in there, and mm. also learn a lot about how how his books came to be. I mean, yeah. I, I thought how he came to write that Ragged Alice book, which was a very different book. Yeah, it was yeah. An interesting. And I think it does show you that you can, you know, as much fun as it is to be a crime author or a sci-fi mm-hmm. author. I think everyone does like to stretch their creative yeah. goals a little bit I think and it's to branch good, out. Because otherwise you can get sort of bored almost. Yeah, you must do. I mean, although having said that, you look at folk like Ian Rankin or Val McDermott and they've mm-hmm. just done, you know, phenomenal crime yeah. over a long period of time. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. But then, yeah, as we, we spoke to Sarah Pimbra earlier in the season and she was very much, she enjoyed genre hoping yeah. because... Yeah because of that very reason. But thanks again, anyway, to Gareth for appearing on the podcast. We really appreciate him taking the time to do that. Um, And next week, we've got Jonathan Whitelaw, who has written a series of books called the Hell Corp books, I think is is how you would, or is the name of the series, about God and the devil, and the devil setting up a corporation. (laughs) Yeah, they're sort of um, darkly humorous kind of Good Omens. Good like, Omens is almost yeah. exactly what I was thinking of. Yeah, that kind uh, of uh, dark humour. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it was really interesting to speak to Jonathan. Yeah. So um, tune in for that episode. It's a great chat. And don't forget, is there still time to enter the competition, Marco? There is still time to enter the competition. So last week's episode, we spoke to Dave Cook, the indie comic writer who created Kiltopia uh, with Craig Payton. And he has kindly donated a signed copy of Volume mm-hmm. 1 of Kiltopia and you can also win a page one notebook, which is our writer's notebook with different sections for characters, plot, etc. That's unsigned. Well, That's we unsigned. We can sign, sign it if you like. want. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you want to enter that competition, the, the posts are on our Twitter and uh, Facebook page for the details. I'm not going to go through them again now because <laughs> we've only got a limited amount of time. <laughs> um, uh, but please do enter. Uh, and you you might win those. Yeah, and thank you for everyone who has entered so far. Yeah, really appreciate that. And uh, as Tarek said at the start of the podcast, if you want to send us an email, just send us one to podcast at rightgear.co.uk yep. or send us a tweet, post it on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, we'd Catch love to street, hear from you. Yeah, exactly. Homes. We'd love to hear from you. <laughs> Um, whether it's about writing or not, just speak yeah. to us, people. Please. <laughs> so lonely. <laughs> I have to speak to Tarek all the time. <laughs> um, but that's about it from us, and we'll just leave you with a bit more about page one, and we'll speak to you next week. See you next week. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So, how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying, or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. 
let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made page one. Page one is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project, divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realised you need to plan how to let people read it, so we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic, or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please leave a comment down below, hit that thumbs up button, and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UKPage1, as evidenced here, and our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later. Thank you.